Dave Roskelly, the first American to summit the volcanic seven summits, which are the tallest volcanoes on each one of the seven continents. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. What you do, mountaineering, climbing these peaks all over the world, has got to be an expensive venture. Mm -hmm. What is it that you do for a living that allows you to do that, to take the time and the money to do that? Right, and I'm glad you said time because it's not just always about the money, it's about the time as well. So I am fortunate enough, I have, I'm a founding partner of an environmental engineering firm. We have some really great clients, and I also teach at the University of Utah, I'm adjunct faculty. So I have really, really good people that I work with. Notice I would never say anybody works for me. I work with them. Yes. And uh, they cover for me while I'm gone, and they do a great job. But uh, I've been very fortunate to have success in my business. Why do you climb? I mean, <laughs> why do hard things like climbing yeah. these tallest peaks? You just said it, hard things. I, I, I love doing difficult things. The, the very short answer, the elevator kind of speech answer is it brings me joy. I love doing this. Uh, I, it's, it sounds selfish, but I just absolutely love it. The, the slightly longer answer is I like to inspire others and I like to do difficult things. I like to solve problems. And when you climb mountains, you're, you're solving problems. And, uh, and I, I, re I speak to uh, youth frequently, uh, screenagers as I call them, mm -hmm. and I like to encourage them to stay away from electronics and get outside. Uh, spend more time outdoors. Uh, I am just as addicted to my phone and electronics as everybody else is, but every once in a while it's just good to get away and get, get out, get back in touch with nature, but do difficult things. I think it's, it's a very, very good mantra. When you are on the mountain and you are solving problems, what kind of problems are you talking about that you are solving? And when in that whole process do you get the biggest kick, mm -hmm. like, this is why I'm doing this? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, you know, one of the, I, I'm going to answer it this way. One of the most difficult things about it is uh, having to deal with things out of your control. So the weather, you just have to learn to be patient and learn to adjust. And I'm very A-type, and that's difficult to do. And I think that's why this is generally kind of an older person's game. Uh, it, it isn't something that a lot of younger people do. This is something that older people do. But I, I love, uh, you know, roping together as a team and, and solving challenges as, as, a, as a team having to overcome crevasses and ice falls and things like that. All of those are challenges you have to overcome. Or sick teammate, uh, you know, as they say, the weakest link is uh, as strong as your, the way your team is. So if somebody's sick, you might be feeling 100%, but you're, you have to take a rest day while somebody heals. Tell us about these seven volcanic summits. Tell us why hasn't an American conquered those seven volcanic summits yet? Uh, I think it's multifaceted in the answer. Part of it is, uh, I don't think many people have thought of it, it's kind of a new thing. So there's traditionally been the seven summits, which is the highest mountain on each continent, the seven volcanic, because we know volcanoes and mountains form differently. Uh, it's so new, I'm only, you know, I'm, I think I'm like the 19th human to do it first American. The reason why no American's done it yet is because the high point of it, the high volcano in Asia is Mount Damavand in Iran. And as an American, it's very difficult to go there, as you may be aware, with current events. So I was fortunate enough to go in 2018. And, and I will say I had an absolutely fabulous experience. It, it was great. The Iranian people were nothing but kind. Mm. Yeah. Tell, tell me the difference between climbing a mountain and climbing a volcano. How are those different? Uh, you know, they're, they're really not terribly different. The high volcano in the world is Ojos del Salado in Chile, and it's almost 23,000 feet. And so you're dealing with elevation just like you would on a mountain. In fact, uh, the two, uh, you kind of get a twofer on the list. So Kilimanjaro is the high volcano of Africa, and uh, Elbrus in Russia is the high mountain and volcano in Europe. So you kind of get a double. So th there's not really much difference uh, between the two. The, the volcanic summits overall are lower than the seven summits. So elevation-wise, mm. they're lower. Mm -hmm. Of the seven volcanic summits that you conquered, which was the most difficult and dangerous, and which was 
the most beautiful in vistas? Uh, so I'm going to answer it backwards. The most beautiful was Kilimanjaro. Uh, I love going to Africa. I've climbed Kilimanjaro twice. Uh, I went the second time with my boys. My oldest graduated from high school. And uh, so as kind of a gift, a present, I took them and other friends and family. And I, I always maintain that uh, Kilimanjaro is very attainable if you are even, uh, you know, kind of moderately fit, you could train and climb Kilimanjaro. And it's just fabulous to go there and experience another culture and uh, go on safari, see the animals. So I always encourage people. And the view from the top is just you know, spectacular. What do you see <laughs> up there? What, what's uh, up? You know, it, the, both times I went, I had fairly clear skies, so you see forever. And, uh, you know, for me, it isn't necessarily about the view. It's the accomplishment. So while the view is gorgeous and beautiful, for me, it's it's more about getting, you know, getting there, kind of that, the, the trip or the, uh, that is the, the goal, not necessarily getting to the top and having a look around, but it's a gorgeous view. And your boys yeah. went to the top with you? They did, yeah. All three of them summited. My sister, my niece went. And, and others and and uh, you know it's fun to so I enjoy this and it's fun I want my boys to enjoy it as well and others that I that I love and are friends with I want them to share in the passion and it, it's amazing in at home in our kitchen I, I always take a summit flag to the top of every mountain I climb and the team signs it and so in our kitchen at home I have the Kilimanjaro summit flag and there have been a number of times where the boys are sitting around doing homework or we're talking about something at the dinner table and I'll say guys look up there look at the flag you did something really tough you did something difficult you can finish this right so uh, it, it's the it's just a great metaphor for life yeah i, I love it and mm -hmm. none of the kids on the way said dad are we there yet <laughs> Well, not necessarily, no. They're, they're, they're kind of beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> you summited Mount Everest in 2013, That's correct? correct. Mm -hmm. now, a total of at least 5,000 people have done that now. <clears throat> Has summiting Everest kind of become a little passe even? <laughs> Has it lost its luster because so many people have done it? Uh, sure, I think it, it, it certainly, I, I think you could argue pretty effectively, I could, that it's easier now than it was when Sir Edmund Hillary did it in 53. Uh, having, you know, just the fact that people have gone before you, that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. You know, Hillary, he had no idea what he was going to run into at the top. So that in, it, in and of itself makes it much more difficult. But uh, yeah, with, uh, with technology, new fabrics, warmer clothes, I mean, these guys climbed in tweed and leather boots for Pete's sake with hobnails. So, you know, the, the gear we have today is, is phenomenal. I'm not going to take anything away from it. It's very difficult to do, but uh, certainly uh, technology and other things have made it a little, and modern weather forecasting, because that's a big deal to get up there in a storm and have a bad day. So even just technology with uh, weather forecasting has played a big role in, in saving lives. And speaking of saving lives, there are about 300 dead bodies on Mount Everest. What are the chances that the next person up there is going to be the 301st dead body? <laughs> yeah. So, yes, uh, not to disagree with you, I think there's 252. Oh, and, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right. But, uh, yeah, the odds are now, it used to be about 20 years ago, the odds were that uh, it was almost as high as 9 or 10% of summiters, not overall climbers. Now it's down mm -hmm. around one point. 3%, 1.4% of summiters pass. Why? So, Why is that? Oh, myriad reasons. Uh, you know, I think uh, health challenges, uh, it's really, really difficult. We were not engineered as humans to operate in those kinds of environments. We're just not. And as it is, you're operating at the fringe of your abilities. And so your heart's working harder. Your blood generally thickens because you have more red blood cells. And so if you think about your heart pumping a thicker liquid as opposed to a thin or liquid, it's going to work harder. So a lot of people, heart attack, uh, pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, everything swells. It's really difficult. You, you don't feel generally really that good. <laughs> so it was great to be at the top, but it's better to be home, having accomplished it, right? <laughs> yeah. So among those people who lose their lives on the mountain, yeah. how many of them die from uh, physical conditions such as a heart attack or edema? Or yeah. 
or whatever happens to them that way. And how many actually die from falls? Like slips, trips, and falls, yeah. that kind of thing. That That is a good question. And, uh, you know, I don't know the exact data on that. It is available. But my sense is that, uh, the, that it's, I, I do know this much, most of the accidents happen on the descent rather than the ascent. Mm -hmm. And the part of the problem is, People give all, they give 99% and then they save nothing to come back down. So their mm -hmm. tank is empty. And uh, that causes them to have issues on the way down and they mm -hmm. slip, trip, and fall. So, yeah. Now, from judging from the pictures that you have provided to us, when you ascended Mount Everest, um, you did so with a long string of about 100, 200 people that were yeah. going up all at the same time. And yet, you mentioned in previous uh, engagements, you've said that when you're on the mountain, you're on your own. It's every man for himself. That, yeah. Do you really feel like you're all alone in a crowd like that? Uh, you do, uh, because everybody is operating really at the limits of their ability. And so I climbed with a really good friend of mine, Steve Pearson, and our Sherpa was, uh, his name was Tile Nuru. So the three of us summited together, and before we went up, we went through all these permutations of, okay, if you get sick, what are, you know? What is your? Are you you know? Generally, our idea was if somebody got sick, the Sherpa gets to go with them, and the you know whoever is feeling better has the option of going to the summit. But the Sherpa goes with the sick person, and if they're sick enough, then you're going down. But we talked about all the what do we do? What do we do if we come acro across somebody that was sick? And both of us agreed we're not going to step over them. We're going to help them. You know that's the human thing to do, right? So uh, it, it yeah, but you do feel alone because if if you have a problem, everybody else is in the same boat, and if they stop to help you, they might die as well. So it, it's a, it brings up some really interesting ethical questions. Mm. Very, and it's hard for people that have not been in that environment. Of course, I'm not saying you're saying this, but armchair climbers are really difficult to, to make those decisions sitting at sea level in front of the television. Yeah. D did you ever wind up in a situation on the mountain where you had to go, uh, what are we going to do with this uh, person? Thankfully, uh, well... Yes, uh, the first I attempted, to, Denali was the only one that I had to do twice. And the first time I went, we had one of the, one of the folks that was with us, uh, he developed pneumonia. And so we did make the decision to come down. And he, he was nice enough to say, hey, you guys can go summit, leave me in the tent. And our comment was, no, we cannot leave you in the tent for, for five days or more while we go and climb and come back and find you perished. So we're going down. And as it was, we 100% made the right decision because as it was, it was even then hard to get him down. Mm. So. How many peaks have you summited in your life? Oh, I don't even know because I've been up and down Timpanogos, a local peak here so many times. <laughs> so I, that's a tough question. I'd say probably at least 50 mountains, maybe even 100. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, it's probably closer to 100 or more now that I'm thinking about it. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Mm. Well, you have to go home and count them up. <laughs> I'll count them up, yeah. <laughs> in your experience on the mountain, have you ever had a close call where you said, oh, man, I don't want to repeat that ever again? Uh, you know, I was, uh, I'm always, I haven't. I've always tried to be super safe when I've, when I've climbed and uh, just try to be really, you know, methodical and pragmatic with my approach to things. And uh, I know this sounds a little far out there, uh, because I think the image that is painted of mountaineers is kind of this, uh, you know, drink a Red Bull and go do an extreme sport, and that, that's not the case. The most high-altitude climbers that you'll find are very methodical. Uh, they, I, I think if you looked at them as a group, lots of PhDs, masters, graduate, you wouldn't necessarily think that, but these are really A-type, sharp people, and they're not, used, they're not going to take chances that way. So I'm... I'm, I'm I'm pretty boring when it comes to that. You know, I have bungee jumped, but I, it's not really my thing. You know, I've hang glided, but I know you would tend to think they go hand in hand and they don't necessarily. Yeah, I don't know yeah. the bungee jumping is my thing either, but I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have you been able to identify what it is about your personality mm. and your characteristics that makes you want to do what it is you do on these mountains? Uh, well, I love, no, I don't, I'm not sure, but it's interesting when we were down, I was just in Antarctica recently, a couple, three weeks ago, and there were eight of us. So there were four South Africans, uh, uh, two other Americans, and a Russian. 
and uh, we had plenty of time waiting out weather to talk about this very thing and it was really interesting we talked about our Myers-Briggs score and how you know we all were really close and you know I commented I said hey what is it that got all eight of us here at the same time and we started talking and I was hearing you know exactly my personality in a lot of these other climbers. It for, was really spooky. <laughs> for those who don't know what a Myers-Briggs score is, explain that. Uh, so us. it's a personality uh, score. I'm an INTJ. Uh, they, you take like these personality tests mm -hmm. and uh, so it was interesting to hear people were very similar in their personalities so that there there has to be you know there was very much some similarities between everybody so now yeah. you say that we as humans are not engineered definitely to not operate yeah. at 29,000 feet which definitely is the top not. of Everest. Everest right and yet the Sherpas are yeah. somehow different yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the, the Sherpas, our Sherpa, Tile, he was born uh, sen essentially at 11,000 feet, so the top of Timp in a town called Namchi Bazaar. And they genetically, if you look at their DNA, they have, they, they're different. And they, they are better at adapting. Their red blood cells are better at carrying oxygen at higher elevations. So, you know, they're rock stars. And, uh, you know, when I was up on Everest, I thought I was pretty cool, pretty good climber. <laughs> and he was carrying three times what we were carrying and he'd run circles around us. And he was so humble and nice. He'd always be, you know, come on guys, see if you can keep up. Let's go. <laughs> and, oh and they're just incredible uh, athletes. They're just incredible what they can do. Now, do they have oxygen as well? He used, yes, Tile used oxygen, just not as much. So uh, towards the top of the mountain, we were on about three to four liters a minute. He was less. And uh, they, he just doesn't need as much. How many people live on Mount Everest? So nobody actually lives there. The highest habitable town is uh, Gorik Shep. And Gorik Shep is give or take about 16 and a half thousand feet, 17,000 feet. It's just down the, the Kumbu Valley from Everest Base Camp. So uh, traditionally the camp is not occupied in non-climbing times of the year. I mean, I'm sure people trek there and go see it, uh, but uh, it's just too, it's kind of beyond where you'd really want to live uh, mm -hmm. and kind of eke out a living. There's, there would be nothing to do there. Mm. So, And yet yeah. the base camps on the mountain are... Oh, during climbing season, yeah, there's, there's climbing season. probably 500 or 1,000 people there. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's like a little mini village. They have a medical center and uh, camps set up. Yeah, it's talk quite to occupied. Me, talk to me about the climbing season. Yeah. When, how does it run? Because I know you have to yeah. pay attention to the jet stream. You're so right. high up, you have to pay attention that's, to the That's exactly the right. Weather. So uh, generally speaking, the climbing season, with the climbing window is about uh, May 15th to June 1. Uh, so there's really yeah, sure. only about two weeks out of the year. There are some times in October and the fall when you can climb, but other than that, 99% of the people that go up go the, up that two-week window. And what's happening is these big storms are coming out of the Bay of Bengal in India. And these are like big monsoonal rains that set in for two months. And they're massive and they actually move towards the Himalayas and push the jet stream aside. So you're timing that jet stream moving because it's always blowing 150 miles an hour up there. You can't go up there in that. And out of that two weeks, you might have four, five, six days where you can actually be on the summit. And when we were at the top, it was as calm as this studio here. Really? It was amazing, yes. That was very cold, <laughs> but... How it cold was, was it up there? I'd say, uh, you know, I did not have a thermometer, but I'd estimate probably 25 or 30 below. But what's interesting is you, you of course, you dress for it, but you get acclimatized. You, you've been outside for six, eight weeks, and your body starts adjusting, and you just acclimatize towards it. So it, it sounds cold, and it is, but you just get used to it. Yeah. Do you, do you ever get to the point where you say, I've had it with the cold, I gotta go sit in a sauna, no. I'm not gonna do this anymore? <laughs> no, I, I, li I like the cold. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily bother me. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, I, I enjoy <laughs> it. I, I wouldn't choose to go sit in the cold, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was in St. George this weekend because it was nice weather and I enjoyed that, but uh, it doesn't, generally it doesn't bother me. I'm from Chicago, it's very cold there. I grew up in the cold, so. It not is what not it is. quite as cold as at the top <laughs> no, of Everest. But it's quite cold. <laughs> yeah. L let's talk about uh, these seven volcanic summits that you went on just a little bit more. Sure. Um, how difficult is it really to do what you did? 
I think it's, I, what I like about the seven volcanic canic summits is it is easier than the seven summits. They're overall lower and uh, I, I do believe they're a quite a bit easier. And so if anybody was saying, I wanna go climb the seven summits, I'd say, hold on, do the seven volcanic first because that's gonna give you a good taste and then move on to the seven summits. I did it backwards, mm. uh, it, it, but. <laughs> but, but you're just like that I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I did it and uh, glad that I was able to to finish it. So. What, what was the most difficult part of it? Uh, you know, for me, I've said this before. It has nothing to do with mountaineering. It's being away from home. I love my family, and I'm a, I like to think of myself as a very responsible father and dad, and I have three boys, and it's hard. This is a very selfish and has nothing to do with work or making a living or anything, and here I am away from them. When I was with Everest, I was gone for six weeks, and, you know, that's a chunk of their life. And so I tried to call home every night as best I could and uh, be part of their lives, but I'm very, very involved. I do not like being away from home any more than I have to. So. A couple of years ago, our oldest son and his wife called us from the top of Mount Fuji. Oh, in, in Japan. Japan. Yep. Yeah. Can you call anybody from the top <laughs> of Mount Everest? Uh, you can, but interestingly enough, the interesting answer to that, uh, of course, you can take a sat phone, yeah. and I have a sat phone. Our team leader said, actually, don't call anybody, and here's why. I had a tracker so they could see where I was. He said, what happens is people will call home, and then they let their guard down. I've oh. done, I've made it. And then the statistics have played out that they kind of let their guard down because they've finished, and then they fall. Oh, so he yeah. said, don't do it. And I said, all right, that sounds, that's a good enough answer for me. I won't. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I've called, uh, I would have to defer to the boss, my wife, but I don't mm -hmm. know if I've called from any summit per se. Yeah. Now, when you're climbing Everest, and I would imagine other peaks as well, sometimes you have to climb at night. Oh, yeah. Tell me, how much more dangerous is that than climbing during the day? Yeah, when you're climbing, when you leave base camp to go, of not base camp, excuse me, you leave the South Call to go for the summit of Everest, uh, we left just as the sun was going down, so it was about 7.30 in the evening, give or take, and you climb all night. And so, uh, what, what, and you're climbing by headlamp. So of course, you're not having the view that you would during the day. But what I've come to realize is it's the sunrise and set that causes the weather. So when the sun is setting, you're getting that cold and the warm uh, cycles, and that's what causes the weather. So generally, the weather calms down after the sun sets, and it's good to go to go climb. So it's kind can, of double edged. Can you see where you're going though? Uh, yeah, mean, we had, uh, the, yeah, the we had. Yeah, we. Oh, we summited at uh, like 7.30 in the morning, so we had absolutely gorgeous uh, views for, for right. miles. Right, yeah. but on the way up at night, uh, can you I see watched where you on, are? Yeah, yeah yes, you, you got the, the stars leading the way, but I watched the Big Dipper kind of go over the top of me oh. and, and the moon a little bit. It was really neat, and then watching the sun, oh, you watch out over uh, Tibet, and you see the sun coming up over the horizon, and it's actually high enough you can start seeing the curve of the Earth. So it is, it, it, I won't forget that. That was very remarkable to, to see that. And, and you, you start to realize uh, how special our planet is, how special that, that place is, you know, being up there. Mm -hmm. How has mountaineering changed you? Oh, wow. Uh, it, it definitely has made me a more patient person. I was not nearly this patient when I started climbing uh, kind of to this level, I'd say 16 or 17 years ago. And I was forced into it because you can't be, uh, it, you can't be rushed. You have to wait for the weather and that's totally out of your control. And it's frustrating when you're kind of type A American saying, let's go, let's go. You can't do that. So I would say it has made me a more patient person. And I like that about myself. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it also, uh, the other, th I would say visiting with lots of different cultures, you know, traveling to all the countries, I've, it has completely changed me. Uh, seeing the rest of the world and seeing kind of beyond the kind of American goggles and, and seeing the rest of the world, it, that has completely changed me. Yeah. The average for the better, for the better. For the better. Yeah. The average American has not been out of yeah. the United States. Right. Most Americans stay right here. And you should. I, I would encourage you to, to travel and go see places. Yeah. What, what is the one thing that you bring away from all of the cultures that you have <laughs> been exposed to? That, that is a, a great question. We're all, I think, 
I, I, we're all the same uh, at, at the very core. And uh, you know, whether you're poor circumstances, wealthy circumstances, people are, are people and you should love everybody and just be nice to them. So mm. mm -hmm. you've done an awful lot yeah. on the mountain. Mm -hmm. What's still on your bucket list? Uh, yes, so uh, if you're familiar with the concept of a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, I always have one of those looming out there. So uh, my next goal is I want to go to the high point of the moon. Uh, it was the only high point. high point of the moon. It was only identified about 10 years ago. Uh, I don't think you would hike there with a backpack traditionally like you would in mountaineering. You'd drive something. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'd love to do is uh, drive like a Tesla uh, <laughs> to, you know, something Tesla, get Elon Musk on board and go to the high point of the moon. Yeah. Are, are you taking steps to be able to do that? I would love it, yes, yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because uh, the, the current presidency has bumped up their time frame. They want to put a man back on the moon by 2024. So uh, this is, I think in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see a big, big push. And then of course you have SpaceX. And quite frankly, I think it's gonna be Elon Musk is, if you're gonna go to the moon, it's gonna be with him. So, yeah. and, and I think if you wanna, if you wanna set uh, kind of set the bar and open up for, for travel to the moon and colonization and then travel to Mars, you need to go to the high point. You, you need to, you need to, to say, hey, I've, I'm here, and then, and then other people will come. So you're going to go from Dave Ross Kelly Mountaineer <laughs> to Dave Ross Kelly Mountaineer aus astronaut, correct? Sure, yeah, I would love it. Wow. I think it's possible. It, you know, if you, if you remember the Apollo missions, so 15, 16, and 17, they put lunar rovers on the moon, and they drove around yeah. uh, on the moon. I remember yeah. that as yeah. a kid and seeing those lunar rovers, and they were electric. So why not another electric vehicle up there? It's wow. possible. Yeah. Well, Dave Ross Kelly, the first American to conquer the volcanic seven summits, also conquered Everest, and who knows, maybe someday the moon. There you go. Thanks so much Thank for being so part much. of Three Questions. Thank you.